All right, go ahead and open your Bibles to Luke chapter 18. As you go there, I should say, I bet, I bet when you were growing up, you learned a lot about how to ask your parent for, parents for things. Uh, you figured out that there were certain things you just shouldn't ask for. And there were certain things maybe you learned that if you timed it just right, maybe you could ask for those things. And there were certain things it was better to ask dad for, and certain things it was better to ask mom for. You learned there were certain tones of voices that maybe worked better than others. You know, I remember a time when my mother was baking cookies, and, and she gave me one right out of the oven. And um, I still remember I ate it, and I explained how wonderful it was, and that my mo- mom must be the best cook in the world. And so she offered me a second one. You know, you kind of learn things. Well, if it was important to learn how to ask our parents for things, how much more important is it to learn how to talk to God, how to pray to Him? And we need to learn what sort of things should we pray for. We need to learn what manner in which we should pray. Well, our text today instructs us on some of those things. It instructs us about prayer. Of course, it doesn't say everything we might want to know about prayer, but it does teach us some very important truths So let's go ahead and read the text, and then we'll hear what it has to say to us. Luke chapter 18, starting in verse 1. This is the word of the Lord. Now he told them a parable on the need for them to pray always and not give up. There was a judge in a certain town who didn't fear God or respect people. And a widow in that town kept coming to him, saying, "'Give me justice against my adversary.'" For a while he was unwilling, but later he said to himself, even though I don't fear God or respect people, yet because this widow keeps pestering me, I will give her justice so that she doesn't wear me out by her persistent coming. Then the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. Will not God grant justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? Will he delay helping them? I tell you, that he will swiftly grant them justice. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Now, as you can see from this reading, the text uh, incorporates a parable that was taught by Jesus, and it gives us some helpful explanation along the way. As, As you might see, Luke gives us right up at the beginning what we used to call in the military the bluff, the bottom line up front. Uh, So he gives this instruction, uh, and he tells us that this instruction is given first to the disciples. It says he talked to them, that is the disciples, and it's about the need to pray always and never give up. So in other words, this whole instruction is about persistence in prayer. Now it's very helpful that Luke does give us this extra explanation and that Jesus, the, the explanation afterwards, because otherwise this parable would actually be a little bit difficult to understand. And even with this explanation, this parable is actually one of the more misunderstood, misapplied parables uh, that Jesus told. But first of all, let me just place this in context, literary context. Is if you want you, I want you to notice that this parable comes at the end of Jesus' instruction to his disciples that we talked about last week. The, this instruction uh, that starts in verse 22, and you notice he t- starts talking about the days of the Son of Man. And if you remember the sermon from last week, you'll remember that the whole passage was about the second coming of Christ. And that was spoken of as the days of the Son of Man, or the day the Son of Man will be revealed. And now our passage today references the same thing. He says it ends with, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? So by doing this, by putting parallel phrases at the front and the back, kind of like bookends, the author, Luke, is signaling to us that this is all one package. This is all one set of instruction. And that's important context. So we see that this passage in chapter 18 is about prayer, but it's about prayer in a specific context. You actually might remember also from last week that I ended by talking about the things we should do as we wait for Jesus to return. And I said we should be patient. We should remain committed to him. We need to be prepared for him to come at any time. And then I also said, and we need to pray. We need to ask God to fulfill his promise that Jesus will come back. We need to ask him to establish his kingdom on earth with justice and righteousness. And so this parable then is illustrating that call to prayer. It's, it's 
instructing us to pray, come, Lord Jesus, we long for you to return and reign. We desire to see your glory shine over all the earth, that all would bow to you, that righteousness would flourish. That is the prayer that this is illustrating. Now, of course, as we'll see, that the, the principles this passage teaches us can be broadly applied to other sorts of prayer as well. And as we go forward, we'll see that. So going forward, I want to first explain the parable and what Jesus is teaching us through it, and then we'll look at applications of the parable, which will go a little bit more broadly. So the applications will look at both what we should be praying for and how we should be praying. All right, so first let's look at the parable itself. Now, as I, as I mentioned, Luke tells us what the parable is about. So we know right up front that it's instruction to us to keep praying and to never quit. Now, and Jesus starts off, as we see in this parable, the way he usually does in his parables, that there's this certain man, and he's in a certain town, and we see in this one that the man is a judge. This is someone who would handle disputes, local disputes among people, or matters of Mosaic law. Now, at that time, a judge like this was probably one of the most prominent members of the village or the region, whatever it is. Prominent, probably in the sense of being the richest, because not probably not uncommon that they would buy their position as a judge uh, from, you know, to get the honor from the Romans or whatever. And so uh, Jesus describes him as not fearing God, not respecting persons, uh, which, in other words, he made his court decisions based on just whatever he thought was best, whatever benefited him the most, might get him the best bribe or whatever. He obviously did not hold God's law in high regard. And even if people pointed out his partiality or his injustice, he didn't care. He just did whatever he wanted to do. He didn't feel any shame in doing things this way. And what we see right off the bat is this is the exact opposite of what judges in Israel were supposed to be. We know from the Old Testament, 2 Chronicles chapter 19, verse 6 and 7, this is where King Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah at the time, he appointed judges, and he told them, this is what he told them, he said to the judges, Consider what you are doing, for you are not, you do not judge for a man, but for the Lord, who is with you in the matter of judgment. And now may the terror of the Lord be on you. Watch what you do, for there is no injustice or partiality or taking bribes with the Lord our God. That is not what this judge was like. In fact, he was an example, unfortunately, of the corruption that was very common among judges of that day. All too common. And then we're introduced to the widow. And the widow, uh, you don't necessarily need to think of an older woman. In, in, in the mortality rates of that day, a widow could be at any age, not uncommonly. But along with orphans, widows were the epitome of the weak and the vulnerable in society. They had no protector, no advocate. They were ob ob well, very often taken advantage of. And it seems that this widow had suffered exactly that. She had been taken advantage of because when she asks the judge for justice, the word she uses there, the word that is used here in the text, is not the most common one for justice. Uh, it, is, it does mean justice, but it has the additional connotation of avenging someone, righting something that has been wronged, taking action on behalf of someone who has been wronged in some way. So the likely picture in this situation, if you were to understand, and if you were in that culture and, and kind of understood what was going on, the likely thing that would have happened is this, after this woman's husband died, people took advantage of her, found loopholes in the law to take away the land that belonged to the husband or take away her income from the land that she was due or something like that. So she's coming to this judge then to make it right. She's asking him to overturn whatever this has been done to her, uh, this, whatever this wrong was, and she's probably asking for legal consequences or punishments to be applied to those who had wronged her in this way. And at first, the judge wants nothing to do with her. He says, for a while, there's, as implies a significant length of time, he's been giving her the cold shoulder and just ignoring her pleas for help. But she keeps coming back. She just keeps coming back over and over and over again. The word for pestering here that, it's, is, that is in the text is used of tedious, repetitious labor, like maybe digging a trench or something like that. Any action that when you do it just feels like it goes on forever and never ends. And finally, the judge couldn't take it anymore. He had been worn down by this determined persistence. 
And the only reason he even gave her satisfaction was, as the text says, uh, the, literally the way you translate the, um, the word worn down is that to give him a black eye. In other words, he feels battered and bruised by her continual nagging about this. And perhaps, sometimes that idiom could also mean black in the face, so perhaps he's thinking maybe this would besmirch his re reputation in some way. So finally, he grants the widow's request. So that gives us some, some basic understanding of the sense of what Jesus was telling in this parable, which, gives us, which is primarily the description of the judge and the widow and their actions. So, but now we need to know the meaning fully of the parable. We need to know the referent. What are these symbols really in the, in the parable referring to? And, so, and the important point we need to look at is what are the points of similarity and difference between the symbols and their reference? And that's what Jesus explains then in verses 6 through 8. First he says, listen to what the unjust judge says. Not that what he says is, is like an example to us, but in the sense of, Pay attention to what's going on here. This is important. I want you to learn this lesson. Now, it tells us that the widow corresponds to the elect. So the widow symbolizes the elect. That is God's chosen people. That, in other words, not just Israel, but all those who would worship God truly. So it's referring to followers of Christ, those who have become citizens of the kingdom of God. And the, the point of comparison that we should be seeing here is their weakness and vulnerability. I mean, the, the people of Israel were certainly weak and vulnerable at that time. Uh, the church has been in a position of weakness throughout most of its history. Uh, the true ch Christian church has been rejected and oppressed by the rest of society. And whether, weak, whether we are weak and vulnerable uh, in this society sense, we're always got to be recognizing that we are weak spiritually. We are vulnerable to exploitation by spiritual powers that are at work in the world besides the being put upon by governments and cultures and those kinds of things. So the, so the window symbolizes all those who follow Christ. But now when we come to the judge, we need to be careful here, because God is not equivalent to the judge. This is the misstep that some people make when they're applying or trying to understand this uh, parable. God is not equivalent to the judge. It's actually the difference between the judge and God that is what is being highlighted in this parable. The only point of similarity between God and the judge is their role as judge. So the judge has the power to give justice to the widow. And of course, God, we know, has the power to give justice to his people. But the more important thing is the difference. There is a massive difference in their character, in their character. So where the judge in this story has no compassion, he has no real interest in justice, we know, by contrast, compassion is the very center of God's character. I mean, that's how he narrated his glory to, to Moses on Mount Sinai. That's, and that was picked up by David in Psalm 145, verse 8, where it says, The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in faithful love. And not only that, God is the very definition of justice. The, the writer of Psalm 89 praises God, saying that righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. So while both the judge and God have the power to give justice in their respective areas, the judge has no interest in it. But God delights in justice, and he will do nothing but what is just. He will, he will act justly always with compassion. So here's the argument then of the parable. Is basically, if even this nasty, selfish judge who cares nothing for justice eventually gave in because of the widow's persistence, how much more, that's the thing you need to remember, how much more will God, who loves justice and cares for the downtrodden, quickly give what is needed? If this insensitive man finally responded to this woman who he didn't even know and he didn't care about at all, how much more will God respond to his children whom he loves? That's the message of this parable. He will not delay in his response any more than necessary. He will vindicate his people. He will rescue them from their suffering. So that is the meaning of the passage. That's the, the, the parable that Jesus told his disciples. That's the main uh, sense of it. Now, I, on, on the surface, at least the basic application is quite clear, isn't it? I mean, that's 
what Luke says in verse 1. We should pray always and never give up. That's, that's the bottom line. But I think there's more that we can unpack here. Uh, and I want to direct your attention to two broad areas of application of how we can apply the message of this parable. And the first is what we pray for. Uh, you know, so what we learn from this passage should, should shape the content, at least broadly speaking, of our prayers. And then the second broad point of application is how we pray, which is persistently, obviously, but I want to talk more about what persistence means with respect to our prayers and why persistence is important. So what we pray for and how we pray is what we're going to talk about now. So in this passage, what the widow asked the judge for is justice. And Jesus said then in response to that, that God will grant justice to his elect who cry out to him day and night, who pray to him. So the implication then is that we should pray for justice. And certainly a large part of praying for justice is asking God to vindicate us, vindicate his people. We're, we're asking God to show the world that our faith is real, that it was justified, that God really is who we've proclaimed him to be. And that we, we, we ask him for the, to, to bring to an end the oppression of God's people at the hands of the wicked. That's certainly a big part of what praying for justice is. But I want to broaden our understanding of what we pray for when we pray for justice. Because it's not intended to be primarily self-serving. There's a lot more that's implied in praying for justice. So follow my logic a little bit here. What is justice? Well, justice is upholding or enforcing conformity to a certain set of rules or laws, right, in, in an impartial way. So when we pray for justice, we are asking God to bring about the upholding of his laws on earth. And in order for God's laws to be upheld or to be enforced in any widespread and consistent manner, then God's kingdom must be established on earth. And God's laws are an expression of his will. So this idea of praying for justice, that's the beginning of the prayer that the Lord gave to his disciples. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Because when God's kingdom comes, then justice will reign. Then righteousness will be the norm. Then the weak and the vulnerable will not be exploited or oppressed anymore. And those who do right will be commended, and those who do wrong will be punished. That's what we pray for then when we pray for justice. But I would say that praying for justice implies even more than that as well. Think about God's law for a minute. Whether that be the law of Moses, whether that be any of the other commands that we see in the Bible. Now God's law is different from human laws that we're familiar with, whether that be federal law, state law, municipal code, whatever. These human laws are, are made by committees and congressional assemblies and those sorts of things. There's no intrinsic connection between the laws and the people who wrote them. They're distinct from those who wrote them. But it is different from God's law. It's different with God's law. God's law is an expression of who he is. God's law reveals his character. It reveals his will. So when we look at the laws and the commands in Scripture, we, we see what God approves of. We see what he disapproves of. We see how he thinks. We see what angers him. We see what pleases him. So justice in the context of God's law is not so clinical and dispassionate as we think of maybe a courtroom should be in a human sense. Justice in the context of God's law is conformity to God's character. It's very personal, much more personal than we typically think of, of justice. Justice in this context is lining up with just who God is, lining up with his approval, with his disapproval, with his pleasure, with his wrath, all those things. So then an implication of this parable then is that Jesus is telling us we should pray in accordance with God's character. Let me, let me just give you a few examples of that. Uh, we know that God is gracious and compassionate. He's slow to anger and abounding in faithful love. So in accordance with God's character, it is in accordance with God's character to pray in a way that shows compassion. Like, for example, to pray for the alleviation of someone's suffering. That's in line with God's compassion. But we also know that God is a father, and he's like a father, and that he instructs, and sometimes he does that with discipline and with hardship. 
So it's also appropriate to pray that a person would learn the lessons that God has for him or her through the suffering that they're in. And another example, if there's a mean, uh, wicked person who's harassing or oppressing us in some way, it would be in accordance with God's character, as he's revealed it in Scripture, to pray that God would soften that person's heart and grant him repentance. Because God has said in his word, Ezekiel 33, 11, this is the declaration of the Lord God. I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that the wicked person would turn from his way and live. So to pray that way would be in accordance with God's revealed character. But it would also be in accordance with God's character to pray something like, God, please bring that person to repentance. But if he does not repent, then bring his wickedness down upon his head. Because that is justice according to God's law. God has said that he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. Now, of course, we should never pray such a thing out of vindictiveness, only as a desire for God's justice to be done. But that's in accordance with God's character. So we should always be asking the question as we go to pray for things, does this fit with God's character as I see it in Scripture, as it has been revealed? I mean, because why would you ask him for something that goes completely against his nature? Uh, you know, it would be like, I, I mean, it's kind of hard to come up with a suitable illustration uh, on the human side for this, but just let's just say, um, I don't know, for men, let's say your, your wife hates being dirty, hates bugs, uh, hates snakes, all those kind of things, and you say, hey, honey, for our wedding anniversary this year, how about we go for a week backpacking trip in the mountains? Do you think she would be pleased with that request? I mean, we're only talking about the level of preferences here, not fundamental nature and character like with God, but, but still, I mean, it makes it seem like you pay no attention to what she likes and what she doesn't like. Or for another example, if for maybe if you, you owned a business and you run it by the book, you, you follow all applicable regulations to the letter, and you, you make it clear to your employees that everything would be above board at all times, and honesty is the most important thing to you, would you be then pleased if an employee came to you and asked if he could creatively alter the business record or the, the balance sheets? Because, you know, because then they'll put more money in the business, and then there'd be more money that you could give bonuses to people. Win-win for everybody, right? But no, that totally violates your character, totally violates the ethos on which you run your business. So that's kind of what it gets, getting at what it's like to ask God for things that completely go against his character. So that's, that's kind of what it's like when we pray for things that are completely selfish. Like, I want this, I want that, make my life easier. James actually gives us a rebuke for that, James 4.3. He says, you ask and you don't receive because you ask with wrong motives, so that you may spend it on your pleasures. You ask selfishly. So we all need to do a periodic audit of our prayers. Are we praying for things that accord with God's nature and God's character? But here's the promise, though. When we do, we can pray with confidence. Because it says in 1 John 5, 14, this is the confidence we have before him. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. So that's what we should be thinking about, what we pray for in accordance with his character, ultimately. That's one of the implications of this passage. But even more central to this passage is how we pray. And the main thrust, as we have already seen from this instruction, is that we should pray persistently. We should pray continually without giving up. Okay, fair enough. That's pretty clear from the passage, right? But one of the questions you might have in your mind is, why do we need to pray with persistence? I mean, doesn't God hear us the first time? I mean, have you thought about this? Doesn't he hear us the first time? Do we really need to wear him down like the widow did the judge? Do I just need to keep praying over and over again? Well, yes, he did hear you the first time. We, we already heard that promise in 1 John 5, 14 that we just read. And no, you don't need to wear him down. I mean, the whole point of the parable has been the contrast between the judge and God. The judge needed to be worn down because he didn't really want justice. It's, the contrast is important between the judge's lack of compassion, his unwillingness to respond, and God's great compassion, and his delight to respond and rescue his people. So the idea of persistence is not that it's some way of manipulating God to get what you want from him. I mean, our prayers are not supposed to be like a little child asking his mother over and over and over again for a piece of candy. 
And then finally, with exasperation, she says, fine, and you know, gives it to him. It's not like that. You don't have to think, well, okay, I've prayed for this nine times. If I pray the tenth time, then maybe this time I will get what I'm asking for. That, no, that is not what this parable is teaching. But unfortunately, that is the way a number of people have taken it in the past, and that's, we need to not take that away from it. Many people look at this and say, well, I just got to keep praying, and eventually, if I pray enough times, God will give it to me. No, that's not what it is. In fact, Jesus himself says in Matthew 6, verses 7 and 8, he says, when you pray, don't babble like the Gentiles, since they imagine they will be heard for their many words. Don't be like them, because your Father knows the things you need before you ask him. So more words doesn't get you the answer you want. More times of praying doesn't do it. The, the important thing is prayer is not manipulation. I'll say that again. Prayer is not manipulation of God. So the question then, we come back to the question. So why does Jesus exhort his disciples to persistence in prayer? Well, I'll tell you that I think it's because, well, it can be verified from Scripture, the thing about it is that persistence reveals our own hearts. That's, what it's, that's why persistence is important. Persistence doesn't change God. Persistence reveals our inner selves. And there are three, three things that persistence reveals about our hearts. Well, there's probably more than this, but there's at least three that we're going to be talking about today. Persistence reveals desire, and it reveals dependence, and it reveals faith. So first of all, it reveals desire. You know, if you, if you really want something, you have no trouble asking over and over and over again for it, right? I mean, just think about that example of the young child asking his mom for candy. He really wants that piece of candy. And that desire then is expressed by his continual asking for it. So the question is, when you're praying for something, do you really want it? Do you really desire that thing? Do you really want Jesus to return and establish his kingdom? Do you really want his will to be done on earth? Do you really want God's glory to be made known and for his name to be exalted? Do you really want that person to get saved? Do you really want to grow in Christ-like character? I mean, all these are things you should be praying for according to Scripture. And there's many other things we could mention. Does your persistence in praying for them reveal the desire of your heart for those things? Do you want them so bad that you'll just keep asking and asking and asking until you get a response? So persistence reveals our desires. Persistence also reveals dependence. Now this goes beyond to desire to need. To, we could possibly even say desperation to some degree. This, the widow kept after the judge because she knew she needed Justice. He was the one with the power to give her justice. She was dependent on him to give the legal ruling that she needed. She couldn't get it anywhere else. So our persistence in prayer shows that we are dependent on God. We keep asking him because we know that he can give us what he needs, what we need, and he is the only one who can give us what we need. So think about it just a minute for the, from the other side. What would it mean if you weren't persistent in prayer? What does lack of persistence mean? Well, it would mean that you don't really need what you're asking for. It, your prayer then becomes more like asking your friend for a favor. Uh, you know, you know, it'd be great if you could help me with this thing, but if not, don't, don't worry about it. It's no big deal. You know, so in that sort of sense, you ask once and no response, you move on. Uh, or a lack of persistence could also mean that you can get what you need from multiple places. Again, when you ask a friend for a favor, same thing. You might ask one person, like, I don't know, can you help me move this heavy piece of furniture, or can I borrow a cup of sugar, or whatever. But if they don't respond, you don't need to ask again, because you can just ask someone else, or you can just go to the store for yourself, or whatever. So when we persist in praying for things, it reveals our deep need for those things, and it reveals that our, that need can only be satisfied from God, the one we're praying to. So persistent prayer is an expression of dependence. So the question is, do you pray like that? Do you call out to God out, out of a need that only he can satisfy? You pray things like, God, I need your presence. I need your comfort. 
I mean, yes, I have family and friends that can offer comfort to some degree, but that's only effective when you, God, are in it. And God, only you can heal the deepest wounds of my soul. Or God, I need my daily bread. Yes, I earn money and buy food at the grocery store, but you are the one who provides me the ability to work. You're the one who keeps the business running that provides me that income. I recognize it all comes from you. Do you pray like that? Or do you pray like, pray to God like you would ask for a favor from a friend? You know, God, it would be great if you would do this for me. It would be convenient. It would make my life easier. But if not, no big deal. I'll figure out some other way to take care of it. I hope that we wouldn't do that. I hope we wouldn't pray like that. And we, I don't think we'd ever verbalize that we would pray like that. But does sometimes that attitude kind of sneak in to our prayers and how we, how we think about it? So persistent prayer reveals desire, and it reveals dependence, and persistent prayer also reveals faith. Now you might think, well, that seems kind of odd, doesn't it? I mean, wouldn't it be more a reflection of faith just to ask one time and then just know that it's going to be taken care of and you don't have to ask again? And you might think so, but no, I'll, and I'll tell you why. Because I think to keep persisting in prayer, you have to really believe that the one you're praying to can and will give you what you ask. I mean, you, you need to know he would want to give you the thing that you're asking for, that he would be inclined to respond favorably to you. In other words, you have to really believe that what you're asking for is something he'd be willing to grant. Or even better, something that he's already said that he would do, something that he's promised. And you have to trust also that God will respond just at the right time, not too early, not too late, but at the right time, which may be a while from now, which may be require persistence, that, it, that you will just continue to pray. So that's why prayer reveals faith. Prayer, persistence in prayer shows that you trust that God can provide and that he will provide at the right time. The question is, do you trust him that way? And that's why Jesus asked the last question here in this text. When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? And of course, Jesus knows the answer to that question. It's a rhetorical question that's intended to uh, make us think, to make us reflect on what's going on in our own hearts. In the context of the parable, the question is asking, will Jesus' followers continue to persevere? Will they still be persisting in prayer? Will they still be crying out for justice? Will they be looking for Jesus to return, longing for his presence? Will we still be praying, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven? So that's what it's saying in the, in the context of the of the passage, but more broadly speaking about prayer, I think the question would also be asking, do we just throw up a little prayer towards heaven and, and then maybe something will happen, maybe not? Oh well, I mean, it, it's just kind of, I'm not looking for an answer, I just kind of throw a prayer up there and see what, see what sticks. So the question is, do you look for the answer when you pray? Do you expect an answer? Do you persist in prayer? Maybe if you don't persist in prayer, maybe it's because you're not really sure God can do something about it. Or is it maybe because you aren't really sure God wants to do something about it? Or is it because you don't really care that much what happens one way or the other about what you just prayed for? You know, as I think about those questions, I don't know about you, but as I've been thinking about those questions this week, it is really convicting. Really convicting. I mean, we, ha we all have to think, what does my prayer life say about my trust in God? What does it say about my heart? What does it say about my desires to see the will of God accomplished on earth? Now, I just need to tell you that the answer to the, these questions about persistence and perseverance in prayer, the answer is not to grit your teeth and try harder. I, I mean, practical tools can be helpful. Things like, I'm going to pray for this amount of time and, even, and, and maybe set that for a little longer than what you think you can do, or, or thinking like a prayer journal or a running list of prayer requests or um, prayer schedule, whatever. All those things can be helpful, but if all they do is make you go through the motions, then they're not helping. What we need to do is examine our heart. Maybe your prayer time for a, time, for a while should just focus on your relationship with Christ. Just spend time talking to him. Ask him to light a fire in your heart of passion for his purposes. Ask him to increase your love for him. Ask him to help you love others the way he does. 
And then when your heart yearns after his, when your heart beats in step with his, then you won't have to tell anyone, or you, no one will have to tell you to be persistent in prayer. And that, that will just be the natural outflow of your heart. Because prayer is what aligns our heart with God's heart. It's what shows that our heart is aligned in that way as well. You know, thought that you could put in your head is that no one will come to the end of their life and wish they had prayed less. That won't happen. So what we need to do is we need to persevere in persistent prayer. And one of the ways I think we can do that is I want us to pray the Lord's Prayer that he gave us. I'm going to have the words on screen. But as we do it, I would ask you that don't just recite the words. I mean, even, even if you've memorized them, don't just recite the words. I mean, any pagan can, can just recite the words to this prayer. Think about what you're saying. I mean, think about, is this really the cry of your heart? And I'd actually encourage you also to even meditate on these words throughout the week, throughout the day, throughout the week, and, and, and ask yourself, are these really the cry of my heart? Am I really depending on God for these things? So with, with that said, let's pray this together. Uh, those in the room can, can join me uh, verbally, and at home you can, can uh, say it as well, and let's pray this together. Our Father in heaven, your name be honored as holy. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not bring us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, prayer is a great privilege, and, and we, I, I, I want to just say thank you to all those who faithfully pray, pray for the requests that are sent out from the church on a weekly basis, and, and thank you to my wife for sending those out and, and compiling those as well. But please give us the privilege to pray for you. I mean, do you trust that God can take care of each of these situations? And, and we, we, we enjoy praying for the needs of the, of the congregation, so please send in your prayer requests. And if you just want me to pray with you, I would be happy to, whether uh, over the phone or in person, if we can do that. Um, I'd be happy to pray with you about whatever it is. And if you have any questions about what we've talked about today, please let me know about that as well. With that, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Have a good week.